white text over video of past events. Logo, Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. Professional Development Series presents Engaging Individuals with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities in Virtual Programs. As the program begins, a woman speaks directly to us. Only one speaker at a time is visible on screen. A note that while the program mentions ASL interpreters being available, they are not present on this recording. Hi everyone, this is Lisa Rifkin speaking and just welcoming you all to our program today. Uh, I'm one of three co-chairs for the Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium, or CCAC for short. Uh, and I want to mention before I continue that today we do have ASL interpreters and captioning available. If you are having any issues at all accessing them, please uh, chat us, anyone with a CCAC in our name, and we'll get you uh, sorted out. And Claire will share more about that in a second. Um, and so just to give you some more quick intro to who I am, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a co-chair for CCAC, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And a quick visual description of myself is that I am in front of a white background uh, with our Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium logo over my left shoulder, but you see it as my right shoulder because we are not mirrored images. Uh, <laughs> and which is very confusing for me. But uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and learn a little bit more about how to make all of your program and virtual program more accessible to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, before we jump right into the program, I just want to share a little bit more about what CCAC does. So CCAC's mission is to make Chicago cultural spaces more accessible to people with disabilities. We, we achieve this with three main offerings, our access calendar, which lists all cultural programs, accessible cultural programs in the city, an equipment loan program, which is currently on hold, unfortunately, um, but is operated in partnership with the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum, which loans uh, equipment needed to make accessible programs uh, possible for free. So definitely check that out when we are able to, to do that again. Um, and we do provide a lot of free professional programs like this one for cultural administrators. Uh, CCAC is an entirely volunteer-run nonprofit. This year, we also not launched the Illinois Cultural Accessibility Network, or ICANN for short, because we have very long names. And we launched ICANN in collaboration with the Illinois Arts Council. And this organization uh, supports our cultural organization throughout the state. If you're able to support our work now or in the future, please do so and visit our website at chicagoculturalaccess.org to make a small donation and really every little bit does help. Um, today we are suggesting a five do $5 donation if you're able to, uh, but again, our programming is free. In addition to our service providers and presenters coming up shortly, I'd like to thank our CCAC steering committee members who really led the charge for this month's program, uh, Emma McLean and Claire Tilly. And Claire is going to uh, serve as today's moderator. So I'm going to turn it over to her to keep this going. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Risa. Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, as Risa said, I'm Claire Killey and I am a steering committee member for CCAC. I am also a program director at a Chicagoland nonprofit organization called Aspire. My personal pronouns are she, her, and I'd like to also provide an image description by letting you know that I'm wearing a black shirt, long sleeve black sweater. I have long brown hair. I'm wearing an I voted sticker and I'm in front of a white backdrop with the CCAC logo. Thank you for joining us for this month's professional development program. Today, I'll be serving as the moderator for a wonderful panel of guests who will be discussing, as Risa mentioned, considerations for engaging individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, specifically through virtual programs and formats. 
Today's event does include real-time captioning as well as ASL interpretation. Throughout the event, please attend to our chat, which will remain populated with important links and tips as they're referenced throughout the discussion and the panelists talking points. Our four panelists will share ideas from both their professional and lived experiences today. So their perspectives will really hopefully help you as viewers to reimagine online programming. And not only as a substitute for in-person experiences that aren't able to occur right now, but also as a dynamic opportunity to engage audiences in brand new ways. Today's discussion aims to address strategies to enhance online programming that we believe will benefit all learners. So after our initial introductions in just a moment, each panelist will be allotted 10 minutes, 10 minutes each to share their personal and professional experiences, as well as strategies and insights that relate to today's topic. After each panelist has had the floor, we'll move forward with a round of open questions and that includes submissions from you all. So you should please feel free to pose questions in the Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen at any point throughout the session. Um, any questions that we're unable to answer during today's event, we'll be sure to address those in a frequently asked questions document that we will provide in our archives on the CCA web, CCAC website along with the recording of today's session and any related, related resources that were offered. So at this time, I'm so excited to introduce our panelists um, who we're absolutely thrilled to have joining us from all across the country, outside of the Chicago region. Uh, so first off, I would like to invite our, uh, our first panelist joining us from New York, uh, Charlotte Martin to join us on screen. Charlotte is a senior manager of access initiatives at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum. Charlotte has worked in museum education and accessibility for over 10 years. At the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum, Charlotte oversees the team that develops programs and resources for visitors with disabilities and works with colleagues across the museum to ensure accessibility. Since the museum closed in March, Charlotte and her team have adapted access programs ranging from weekend family programs to a week long maker camp to virtual platforms. So Charlotte, can you please share your personal pronouns and a brief dis image description with us? Of course, uh, thank you for having me. Um, so my pronouns are she, her, and I am light skinned with long blonde hair uh, green eyes and I'm wearing a dark blue v-neck shirt um, and I am sitting in front of a couple of windows with uh, the wooden blinds closed and um, a little bit of some of the stuff on my wall is on the side so thank you for having me thanks for being with us Charlotte we'll have you back in just a few moments all right, next, joining us from Virginia, I'd like to invite Jordan Saunders to join us on screen. Jordan is a disability inclusion consultant at the Resource Key and a speech language pathologist. Jordan's work as a disability inclusion consultant seeks to bridge community and inclusion by helping businesses with brand development and ensuring people with disabilities are included as they develop and design their products and services. This is key because it unlocks the door to unlimited opportunities and allows us to change how we are building and to ensure we are building to include everyone in the community. Jordan, can you please share your personal pronouns as well as a brief image description? Yes, hi, my name, my personal pronouns are she, her. My image description is I am a black woman. I am wearing a black sleeveless dress with my hair in a high bun. I am in front of a blue and gold picture. Thank you, Jordan. We'll see you back soon. So joining us from Indiana, I'd like to invite Ross Edelstein to join us on screen. Ross is a Museum Studies Master's candidate at the at IU School of Liberal Arts, an accessibility consultant, and a public programs intern at the Eideljorg Museum. Ross has done extensive research on how museums can engage individuals with disabilities including intellectual and developmental through all forms of programming. In addition, he's consulted with a number of museums in the Indianapolis area on accessibility projects. He is also a person with autism. Ross, can you please share your personal pronouns and an image description? Yes, hi. Um, again, my name is Ross Edelstein. Um, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, quick correction, I'm at the IUPUI School of Liberal Arts, not the 
IU School of Liberal Arts, um, just for the brand marketing stuff with that. Um, as Thank for the you. image description, I am wearing a charcoal suit jacket um, with a purple and white um, button-up gingham shirt. I have a purple bow tie. I'm a white man with dark brown hair and a dark brown full beard with slight tinges of red. And I am wearing a blue and black headset. In the background, I have the Idle Jordan Museum. Great, thank you, Ross, see you soon. All right, and finally joining us from New Hampshire, I'd like to invite Sam Theriault to join us on screen. Sam is an independent museum professional and membership and marketing manager for Museum Education Roundtable. Sam is, is a museum professional and autistic self-advocate who writes and speaks about autistic inclusion in museums. Sam's advocacy has been featured on podcasts such as Autism Stories, and Sam's writing about autism inclusion and related museum programs have appeared in the Journal of Museum Education and on Museum Education Roundtable's website. Sam earned their BA in American Studies and History at American University, their MAT in Museum Education at George Washington University, and also has a background in research and evaluation. Sam, can you please share your personal pronouns as well as a brief image description? Hi, I'm Sam. My pronouns are they, them. I am also comfortable with she, her. Um, my image description is that I am a white non-binary person with long um, wavy curly auburn hair. I'm wearing a collared gray shirt and in my background is my living area. It has um, a black couch in the background, the edge of my desk with some flowers on it and a small bookshelf with various small collection items on it. Great, thank you, Sam. We'll see you soon. Okay, thank you to all four of our panelists. We're thrilled to hear what you have to say today. And at this time, we're gonna be, we're gonna be hearing from each panelist for 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to invite Charlotte back on screen um, and we will start uh, her 10 minute period speaking portion. So um, Charlotte, please uh, take the floor and tell us more about your work and experience. Great. Well, thank you so much, Claire, and thank you, CCAC, for having me. Um, so once again, I'm the Senior Manager of Access at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. And if you aren't familiar with the Intrepid Museum, it is in New York City, and it's based on the former aircraft carrier Intrepid. Um, so it's based on the aircraft carrier. We also have a Cold War submarine and the Space Shuttle Orbiter Enterprise, as well as an extensive aircraft collection and hundreds and thousands and thousands of artifacts related to the over 50,000 people who served on Intrepid during its service. Now, before the pandemic, um, I just wanna kind of set the scene for what we might expect if we were arriving at the museum for one of our access programs. Perhaps we'd see families arriving early on a Saturday morning, decorating paper pilot goggles or astronaut patches for a weight activity, but for heading off on a multi-sensory tour with hands-on activities and exploration in our interactive explorium. We might see a self-contained class or an adult day hab group getting inside a helicopter and sitting inside a pilot seat to get a real sense of what that might be like. We might see families um, grouped together and smelling spices that were featured in a ship Thanksgiving menu and connecting that to their own food traditions. Or we might see all access maker camp campers riveting together materials to help the aircraft restoration team solve a problem. Now, as we all know, this came to an abrupt halt in mid-March. Uh, the museum was off limits, um, but our audience was still there, um, experiencing a sudden disruption in routine and social connection and loss of service. And so our entire department was asking, how can we apply our resources to continuing supporting our audiences and their evolving needs? And so I'll start with our, our work to identify those evolving needs. And I know that Sam will talk more about gauging needs um, later on. So we asked our constituents. We, we spoke with members, uh, fellow members of the Museum Arts and Culture Access Consortium in New York City, um, which consists of other museum and cultural professionals, as well as parents, self-advocates, and teachers. Um, we also spoke with our um, Museum Standing Autism Advisory Council, which consists of self-advocates, as well as parents of children with autism. We also stayed in touch with teachers and day hab coordinators um, pretty early on. 
knowing that people were pretty overwhelmed um, at the beginning. Um, so trying to be respectful of that at the same time. Um, and some of the things that we identified pretty early were the difficulty with connecting to live programs, especially early on. This could be due to an access of technology with multiple people sharing one device um, or poor internet connection. Um, it could be with the challenge of trying to establish new routines um, when so much had been disrupted, um, making it hard to make it to programs at a specific time um, because that could add a lot of stress. Um, we also know that as schooling and other services shifted online, um, some students were adapting really well and loved being able to go at their own pace and repeat lessons. Um, but we also know that many others really struggled. They had might, maybe because of difficulty with focus, loss of that individualized attention and supports, um, trouble with all the screen time, um, and the less access to sensory um, means of, of learning. Um, we also knew that there was a loss of social connections, which is so important to all of us, but especially um, this audience. And I know Sam will speak more about this later. So I'll just say that this was always a focus of all of our programs and something that we um, really worked, uh, worked on supporting. Um, and we also knew that there was limited access to materials. Um, we knew not to assume that anyone has access to any specific materials. Um, and we couldn't assume that people could go out and buy that, especially um, with the loss of income that so many people were experiencing. We also did an inventory of our resources. And I'll say that um, your resources might be different than ours, but you definitely have something at your disposal to use. And so for us, it was knowing that we had historic photos and other kind of paper visuals that we were already using in many of our programs um, and could continue to access from the digitized version of our collection. Um, we knew that we had ex years of existing visual instructions from years of our Access Family programming. And these are step-by-step -step instructions um, that are written out in simple language, large text paired with um, photos explaining everything. Um, we also had our visual vocabularies from past programs and we had the museum's YouTube channel, especially oral history clips and our intrepid minute videos, which we could work into programming and resources. We also had the museum's Google Arts and Culture page, and some of you might have this as well. Um, this is basically like Google Street View, but for inside the museum. Um, it's not perfect, it's a little out of date, um, but it was a way we realized for us to imagine being in the space and also give us flexibility during programming to move around and attend to people's interests. And it was also an opportunity to explore spaces that aren't as accessible. Remember, we are on a former aircraft carrier um, and have a very small submarine. Um, and that we typically don't use during programs. Um, this was an opportunity to open up those areas and take advantage of being online. Um, we also had web versions of other resources, such as a web version of one of the planetarium softwares that we use that we can make available to people as well. We also had our educator expertise. I will say this would become a challenge later on when there was um, furloughs, um, but this was something that we really wanted to tap into um, was our own team as well as the partners um, and the trust of our communities. So we put that together for an evolving response. So initially we developed activity packets. These were meant to sort of replace programs that we had to cancel right away. We had some programs that were scheduled for the weekend that we closed, for example. Um, we used visual in, um, existing visual instructions, um, but assuming that we had no specific materials, so we offered lots of alternatives um, to those materials and we're very selective. And we um, pulled images from our collections and included links to videos and other resources that they could access on their own time. And we shared this with our Autism Advisory Council for feedback um, and got some really great response when we sent those out initially to families who were pretty overwhelmed still at that point. Um, now, as we realized this was gonna be going on, we started offering live programs. Um, and I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, for our family programs, we decided to base it off of the existing schedule that we already had. Um, and we continued creating activity packets for each program. So each program, you know, even if someone wasn't able to make it, there was still related content they could access at their own time and they could also continue their learning. And we also were offering programs by request for self-contained classes, day habilitation programs, and other groups. And I should say that as with our live programs in person, these were all um, at no cost to the people participating. Um, and for all programs, we offer pre-visit social stories. Um, this is something that was really important and recommended to us early on in one of our Mac uh, Zoom hangouts um, was how important that would be because even though it's, you're not leaving the home, it is still a break in routine. 
And we also shortened our programs. Um, they're all 45 to 60 minutes with the exception of our camp. Um, we had our all access maker camp. It's a maker camp for children with developmental disabilities that had been scheduled for spring break, which was just a few weeks after we had to close. Um, so we had to cancel that unfortunately, but we sent kind of PDFs so activity packets to everyone. Um, and then we started working right away to convert our two week long sessions at the end of August to virtual. Um, we really, it was really important to us to maintain the goals of the program of problem solving, collaboration, trying new things and building up some social opportunities through that. Um, and I can, if people have more specific questions about that, I'm happy to share, but I'll say it did take a lot of parent communication um, and really thinking about how we were gonna spread things out. So um, one thing that is really important for all of our programs are pre-visit supports. Um, and I know that um, Ross will talk more about setting expectations and Sam will speak more about gauging needs throughout um, a program before, as well as before and after. Um, but as we do with our in-person programs, for all of our uh, programs we offer by request, we always talk to the group leader about their social, emotional, and academic goals for the program and seeing how we can adapt that. Um, and um, also being flexible about if we're joining their Zoom or they're joining our Zoom, however we want to do that. We send social stories to introduce the educators, set expectations around communication guidelines, and to preview content. And we also can send extension resources for further exploration, such as activity packets or linked to online components. Um, we also send pre-visit supports for all of our family programs, um, includes a detailed instruction email to, uh, email to families beforehand, as well as an activity packet that we send beforehand, as well as again afterward. It can be used to introduce the topic, revisit things, or um, to uh, look at if you didn't make it to the program. Um, and we're also are clear about the restrictions that we have in advance. So for programs for children only, for example, and we, keep, we have to keep the cameras off for other programs, we can keep them on and, and encourage that. For camp, we also sent um, a, a social story. We sent boxes of materials in advance. They had all the materials that they needed. And the end of the day was always a preview of the next day. So something we really tried to incorporate. Now, during the program, things that we found to be really important are ensuring um, that we, we ensure and support multiple ways of communicating. The chat box, um, verbal communication, movement, talking with someone in your household. And I know that Jordan and Ross will speak more about that. And as with our in-person programs, we reinforce new vocabulary and questions with other ways, such as putting the definitions in the chat, in the chat box or using the sign language for a vocabulary word. Um, and we really, it was really important to us to include, continue including sensory engagement, and I encourage you to do so as well. We lost the sense of space of being in the aircraft carrier and the ability to touch artifacts and get inside of aircraft um, and to smell the diesel in the submarine, for example. Some might miss that more than others. Um, so we thought about how we could bring that into the home. So we, like I said, we use a lot of movement. So we'll use sign language to introduce vocabulary. Um, we will. Um, use movement to reinforce concepts. So for example, aircraft handler signals, the aircraft handlers on the flight deck of the ship use special hand signals um, because it was too loud. And so we'll do that as a group um, on Zoom or we'll introduce what we call airplane yoga for, to, to demonstrate how planes move. Um, for touch, we'll compare thing, the way things touched the way things feel um, in the museum with things that might be in our home. So feeling things that are made out of metal, um, and things like that to, to reinforce that. Um, you, you know, once I'm talking about a giant propeller on the ship, I'll use my little fan that I have here. And now we were doing a lot of these programs during the summer. Most people had a fan around um, to, to compare that movement to. For smell, we can't bring smell into your home necessarily, but we'll use a lot of descriptive language um, and accompanying facial expressions to really build up that kind of sensory experience and invite people to imagine it for themselves. And especially during camp, we did a lot of icebreakers um, as a way to build up that kind of social uh, relationship, even though we were far apart. And so we might ask um, the participants to find a favorite toy to show off. And that's not something we would normally do during camp because people don't bring things in like that or find something blue in your home and show it to us. Um, it's low pressure. You don't have to talk about yourself. Um, and it connects to how at a museum we take care of objects, just like you take care of the things that are important to you. Um, after every program, we want to continue the learning. So we'll include activity packets for continued exploration. All the campers kept their materials. And we've gotten great feedback about how that's really enhanced um, continuing the learning. 
Um, and we've seen a lot of crossover from our group programs to registration for family programs, so especially from our adult groups that have signed up. A lot of them have signed up for our sensory friendly evenings, which are now online. So that's kind of an overview, and I look forward to answering your questions at the end of the, of the session today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Great examples of how materials planning before, after, during can really contribute to that virtual experience. So excited to hear more. And again, if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A and we'll get to those later. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite Jordan on screen. Um, Jordan is also going to be utilizing a, um, a PowerPoint. So we're going to be um, sharing the screen so that you can view her slides. And um, Jordan, I'm gonna give you the floor to tell us more about um, your work and experience. On screen, a PowerPoint presentation. At top right corner, a mini video of presenting speaker. Thank you so much. So I wanna talk about, so I've developed many different programs over the years, ranging from inclusive gymnastics programs to reading literacy programs. And the most important thing I have learned is the value in not just providing lessons or activities, but making sure they are meaningful so that your learners are making connections and able to carry over the valuable information you are providing to other settings. So as an audience, I invite you to think of the theme facilitating meaningful experiences for all learners and how you can take the information I provide and implement it in the work that you're doing. The five key engagement strategies that I'm going to talk about um, that will benefit learners are as follows. So number one, language. Number two, structure. Number three, visuals. Number four, context. And number five, consistency. The first one is language. So tip one. Keep it simple and break information down into smaller parts. This is important because when you are verbally providing a lot of information at once, it can be confusing and your learners may have difficulties processing all the information. For example, you could say, first we will review the fruit paintings, then we will create our own fruit paintings. Uh, the next tip is consistent language. This is important because it provides repetition and it helps learners know what to expect. So for example, a facilitator can say, please look at the apple painting. The consistent language or carrier phrase would be, please look at. You can use the same phrase for other directions that you may provide. Now, I will say the same phrase using different language to show you how it could be confusing and why consistent language is important. Please gaze over at the apple painting. So I'm stating the same thing, but using different language. And this could be confusing because you have used a different vocabulary word that may be unfamiliar to some. The second strategy that I'm going to talk about is structure. So tip one, Organize your materials as best as you can or information that you're providing all in one place. This is important because it is difficult when you are jumping from one screen to the next, it becomes harder to process the information that you're providing. For example, you could show maybe all of your paintings first and then if you have videos, you can show them next. Or if you are going to jump from one screen to the next, state um, use transitions. So make sure that you state the transition when it is about to occur. So first we would look at the fruit paintings, then I will show you the fruit painting videos. And if you're using visuals as best as you can, try to have a word next to the visual and use common visuals. Um, all of the icons that I'll show in a little bit, they're all taken from Microsoft Word. Um, I use the icons, and you'll see that in a little bit. All right, so the second tip, show a plan of some sort in the beginning of your online programming before you start. This is important because it helps learners organize the information that you will show them, and they'll be able to know what's to come. So for example, you could use a visual schedule or some type of checklist. Next slide. 
So on this slide, I have the word plan with a checklist icon right next to the word plan. Underneath is a sample list of things that may be covered. So number one is think with a thought bubble icon. And this would be maybe where we would think about a theme that we would be doing for online programming. The second one, learners would know what to expect because I'm going to be talking about explore. So maybe we would be exploring artwork that is pictured. And there's also an icon of a magnifying glass next to the words explore. Number three, connect. There's an icon of the connectors next to the word connect. And for here, maybe we would make connections to artworks, artwork. Number four, create. There's an icon of an easel next to the word create. And here we would create something. Keep in mind, you can help your learners make connections too throughout your online virtual programming. So for example, if you have a painting of a cupcake, I would give an example of a way that I connect to that, that painting. So maybe I could say, I had a cupcake at my friend's birthday party that was yellow. So this is modeling an example of how learners could connect with the artwork that you are showing them. Next slide, please. So the third strategy, use visuals as much as you can. So the tip one is, this is because you need to, visuals are very helpful because visuals help with breaking down complex information. You're learning new information, helping with processing information, and they're wonderful to support nonverbal and verbal communication. The second tip is be consistent with your visuals as best as you can. Um, and this is gonna help too with structure, okay? So learners know what to expect. Um, they will continue seeing these same visuals and that can be helpful when museums reopen too in person. Throughout the museum, you can have these same types of visuals to help with creating these connections. So for example, um, putting a question mark icon next to the word question whenever learners can ask a question. You wanna keep in mind to write the word next to the visual you use. You wanna make sure you can, um, you wanna make sure that you don't assume that your learners will interpret your visual the way you intend it. So you'll see on this slide, there's a describing attributes visual. This is something that facilitators can use when doing a virtual tour for your audience to connect with some of the paintings you show. It provides an organized format. So I'll go over the icons that are listed. The first one uh, is an eyes icon, and that represents what do you see? There's a paint palette icon represents what colors do you see? There's a hand icon where your learners could think about what something may feel like or the texture. Um, the next one is an ear icon, and that's where you can represent what it's something may sound like. And the last one are four small black square icons, and that would represent what parts. You can change this to fit your needs, and there's also other examples online if you type describing attributes visual. Next slide, please. All right, so number four, the fourth strategy is context. So the tip one would be use central themes as best as you can for online programming. This is important because they're a great way to organize a lot of information. This can also transfer to in-person settings as well. For example, central themes can be organized by categories or different elements about artwork. So our central theme today for this artwork we will view is sweets. So on the slide, there's a cupcake that's pictured with vanilla icing, yellow sprinkles, and yellow cupcake wrapper on a yellow background. The title of this artwork is The Yellow Cupcake, and there is an icon of a cupcake. Keep in mind, you can use real pictures and visual icons like I've shown on this slide. There is a picture of a cupcake and a cupcake icon next to the word cupcake. On the left side, 
We still have our describing attributes visual, which is helpful to provide context and providing a reminder for your learners to think about different ways that they can connect to the artwork that is presented. Next slide, please. The fifth strategy, consistency, be consistent. And this is embedded across every previous strategy that I've mentioned. Um, consistent language, consistent transitions, structure, visuals. Uh, and this is important because this will help learners increase understanding of the information you present. So on this slide, there is an icon of a watch and the words last activity. So learners know the watch is representing the last activity. I would use this every time for online programming when transitioning into the last activity. Next slide, please. This last slide is an example if you create something. There is an easel icon next to the word create. To the left, there are, uh, are materials that the learner would need for, let's say if we're making a craft related to the cupcake picture. So on the, in the middle, I would provide a picture of what we would be creating. So I would provide that in the middle square. So there's a model. On the right side, there is a visual timer, which is another great visual for learners to know how much time they have to create whatever craft it is. You will also see a question mark icon in the bottom right corner, which is a visual so learners know this, this is a great time to ask questions. I would point to the question mark with my pointer and ask if anyone has questions during virtual tours. And this is a great way to keep things organized and allow your learners to know what they see, um, to allow them to know when they see the question mark, they can ask questions. She silences an off-screen alarm. And that are, those are all of the different strategies. So by doing this, this is going to really help um, facilitate meaningful experiences for your learners. And this, these strategies can be carried across. Um, caregivers can use these. Anyone can really use these. Um, and that's how you facilitate meaningful experiences for learners. Thank you so much, Jordan. That was so helpful to have you model those visual elements for us and take us on that journey. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to have um, Ross join us back on screen to tell us about his work and personal experiences. Ross, you have the floor. All right, well, thank you. Um, so sort of to start from where I'm coming from with everything, I first really found out about museum accessibility and what I'm starting to call museum special education through um, a conference I went to, the Missouri Association of Museums and Archives Conference in 2017 where the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art out of Kansas City was talking about the work that they do with the deaf community. Now, from there, I started museum studies work, um, was accepted to IUPUI and began working at the Indiana State Museum as one of their engagement specialists over the summer. And they had a sensory friendly day. I did not know that was a thing, which, is telling for the person with autism on the staff to not know that. From there, I sort of started working with other museums that became sort of my major research topic. And accessibility sort of became the focus of my work from there, considering that I have a mobility impaired father. My grandparents were both mobility impaired and had disabilities that came with age. My youngest brother is deaf, lowercase d, um, and I have autism. So that's sort of where I approach it because a lot of the various needs that we've had are ones that haven't exactly been addressed, which is the first point of respectful communication. Just having a program is not enough. As Charlotte had mentioned earlier, the best way to make sure that your programs are accessible is to incorporate the voices of those who live being disabled every day and making sure to use their preferred language about their disability. For example, if you have a professor who is named um, 
Dr. John Pepper. The respectful way to initially greet them is Dr. Pepper. However, if they would prefer to just be called John, like all of my professors do, you call them John. It's the same way that I go about addressing people with disabilities. I open with person first language because it shows that we're treating people with disabilities as people. It's how I refer to myself as a person with autism. But if someone would rather be called an autistic person, for example, listen. Listen to what they have to say about their experiences. For example, um, and if that could be put in the chat now, I discovered an article earlier this August about autistic burnout. And when I read it, I had been saying exactly what was described in this article for years. It was the first time that anyone had mentioned that. While these might not be museum specific examples, these are examples of things that I have seen museums do. In a lot of cases, museums will go ahead with a program because in many cases, they don't know where to begin. They don't know where to start looking for these voices. And it's challenging. The easiest way to do it is if you know a friend of a friend, reach out to the people that you know and see if they know anyone. It's the easiest way to be able to get other voices involved. As for other areas of practice that are important, particularly for virtual programming, other than just listening to what people want, is being clear. I know from my own experience that there are times when I lose the forest for the trees as it was. I lose sight of the bigger picture and I end up focusing on a little detail, when the reality is, is there's a much bigger connection to be made. Make sure that you're ta saying exactly what you're looking to have done. And this goes with all programs. Be sure that you're also using reasonably accessible language. And when I say that, I mean, not just being visually descriptive, but also using vocabulary that someone who might have issues understanding multiple larger syllable words or more complicated technical language can understand. For example, I've done some work with through a class with a local community group that covers um, ID and DD individuals um, as part of their mission. And that is something that I have noticed that some of my classmates might not have necessarily thought of off the bat. And it was easily corrected. It wasn't intentional, but it happened. And it's something that definitely has to be considered at all points in a program. For example, if you're an art museum, maybe not talking about, for example, use the number six brush. I'm My background's history, not art. So if that's not a thing, I apologize to all the artists out there. But you don't use a language that somebody might not understand if they're not in the field. Because particularly with intellectual and developmental disabilities, we might not get the jargon. There are lots of concepts that we understand. We understand the concepts. We just might need a little bit of extra clarity to get there. As for accessible features in a program, and I say this as I'm sitting in the opposite of what I'm going to be recommending, but more than just talking, have activities. Um, I know Jordan just mentioned some of that and Charlotte has mentioned that as well, but make sure, and I think that we're all going to hammer on this point, there's something to do. I am in three hour Zoom classes for my masters. It's frankly, and it's nothing against my professors, if any of you are watching this, it's frankly awful for me because I cannot maintain focus. I cannot stay focused for that amount of time without ending up fidgeting, playing with a button, doing whatever to make sure that I'm continuing to work. 
putting all of your information all in one spot is difficult and breaking it up, even if it's just break up a long presentation into now discuss, now have a question and answer session. Make it so that it's there are multiple ways of accessing the information other than just talking. Because I know a majority of the museums I've seen programs from have done it that way. And that's, it's in a lot of ways, nobody was trained for this. I know I certainly, when I started my uh, master's degree a year ago about that I wasn't going to be doing everything online. That's not what any of us expected going into this field. And so what makes most sense is to do that. But it's much harder to maintain that attention span for many people online versus in person. And so making sure that you have, for example, all right, let's take a 30 second break, find something near you. Like for example, in this case, it gets swallowed into the background, but a TV remote to touch or take a moment, step away from your screen, do whatever, or all right, now we're going to talk about things. In addition, for these programs, add in a potential of buy-in. Um, the Indiana State Museum, I saw this, I did not participate in it. I do not know exactly how well it went, um, but they had a travel, they had a summer camp kit um, that they gave out to people. And combining something like that, that maybe you have to p spend a little bit of money. And again, that can be a discussion for putting together these programs, but having something that you can send to people prior to a program that gives you the activities that they can spend a small amount of money on, perhaps even the price of what their ticket might be, would be able to really in most ways help offset some of these challenges for many kinds of learners. Um, and even something simple like write down something that you think about this or draw something you think. Keeping people active keeps people engaged. That is the number one thing I've noticed. And that's where I'll end it. Great, thank you, Ross. Appreciate you sharing your personal experiences. Thank you. All right, I'm going to at this time invite Sam to join us back on screen. Hi, Sam. So you hi. have the floor now. Thanks. Okay. Um, hi. So um, as mentioned, I live in my hometown in New Hampshire. After spending eight years in Washington, DC, I moved back um, about a year ago. Um, when I was in DC, I started my career in museum education at the Air and Space Museum. I was an educator um, in the gallery on the floor. And um, working as a museum educator at that time, um, I had a script to talk about objects and ideas, um, and I studied learning and behavior at, um, in my museum education program. Um, and all of that helped me develop these communication skills so that I could actually carry an engaging back and forth conversation, which is something that I wasn't really able to do um, before I, I got involved with museum education. Um, I was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and ADHD as an adult after I finished school. So for a long time, I had all these challenges that I didn't know how to describe. I would bottle up these sensory overloads from being on the floor of one of the world's most popular museums. And then I'd have these meltdowns when I got home. Um, I've experienced the autistic burnout that Ross described and um, it's very challenging, um, but um, like I used to think there was something wrong with me, but now that I know, um, I can celebrate my diagnosis and the fact that I know these things about myself has given me language to talk about and understand my past experiences and to advocate in museums now. Um, and I understand my access needs and how to meet them um, and try to use 
that ability to speak up for other people, um, which is of course not to say that I know everybody else's experience. Um, I can really only speak to my experience um, and just what I read and um, see in my community. Um, I know Ross touched on this a little bit. Um, I personally do describe myself as an autistic person instead of a person with autism, just because I feel that there isn't any part of me that isn't autistic. It's not something I can turn on and off. It's not something that I can leave at home. Um, I see a preference for both identity first and person first language in the communities that I work in. Um, and just hammering back that point of asking the audience that you're working with what they prefer using respectful language. Um, I did have an interaction with an organization that described people as being possessed by autism recently. Um, and that signaled to me that they weren't really somebody I wanted to work with. So it, it really does um, make an impact when people are deciding whether or not they want to join your program, um, attend a sensory hour at your museum, um, and just using respectful language and deferring to people's choices um, does contribute to developing trust um, in our community. Um, I also want to mention quickly that um, many self-advocates are moving away from describing people as singularly low functioning or high functioning. Often autistic people are perceived, who are perceived as high functioning. Somebody like me may not get the support that I need because people don't immediately see the challenges that I present. Um, I tend to mask and camouflage autistic traits, especially at work so that I can fit in, so that I don't face bias or discrimination, and then have all of these other issues that people won't see because I'm at home um, and in private. And on the opposite end of that spectrum, no pun intended, um, is that many people who are considered low functioning are under, underestimated um, for their abilities. Um, so to me, um, I just see as like describing somebody for their abilities. So I might describe myself as Sam is an autistic person who communicates verbally um, or by their traits, um, somebody who is very interested in animals or something like that. Um, but again, just asking your audience what they prefer um, and using their preferences respectfully. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about how facilitators um, can assess the needs of participants before, during, and after programs. Something that I experienced in a meeting recently that I really loved was that before starting the meeting, the organizers asked everybody in the meeting to share their access needs, um, which of course is something that if you're not comfortable sharing publicly, you might communicate with an organizer privately, whether it's the participant or the teacher or a caregiver, um, whoever it is in that situation. Um, so when I was in that meeting and they asked for people's access needs, for instance, I was able to share, I'm on the autism spectrum, I may not be making eye contact with you, I have ADHD, I may be moving around a lot, but I'm still paying attention. Um, I also was able to ask for um, just a little bit of grace with social interactions and to say, if I'm doing something that um, shows that I'm missing an unwritten rule of our workplace culture, um, please just tell me so that I can fix it. Um, and just be graceful with those interactions. Um, and it worked really well. Um, and it also sort of normalized access needs in the same way that all of us sharing our pronouns normalizes different gender identity. Um, I, Like I said, some people will not wanna share publicly and that's fine. Um, but it also showed me that um, just about everybody did share in access needs, even if they didn't, even if they aren't necessarily disabled or don't identify as disabled, um, everybody has something going on in their lives, especially right now that we may not be aware of. So it just gave us an opportunity to um, see how we could give each other grace in these moments. Um, I also wanna note that especially if a program is long, um, if it's multi-hour or spans across multiple days, functioning and access needs can change um, quickly or over time. Um, 
So it's important to just check back in on those access needs. You might develop a system just like a thumbs up, thumbs down, a rating one through five, a poll, um, or something like that, that allows you to quickly check in and then assess whether you need to make any adjustments for your participants. Um, after a program, offering a means to give feedback about access specifically is a great opportunity um, to learn more about how you can make your programs more accessible. Um, it can be an informal situation, like asking a teacher to give feedback or asking participants to give feedback individually in an email, in a short survey, um, and you can then use that data, whether it's informal or part of a larger evaluation project, to adjust your programs moving forward. Um, I'd like to move into talking about how facilitators can ensure participants are making meaning from the content. Um, I want to reference a study published in Autism, a peer-reviewed journal called Autistic Peer-to-Peer -Peer Information Transfer is Highly Effective. The researchers essentially set up a more complex game of telephone between three groups and studied how the information was transferred. So the three groups were non-autistic people communicating with non-autistic people, non-autistic people communicating with autistic people, and autistic people communicating with autistic people. The researchers found, and I quote, autistic people shared information with other autistic people as well as non-autistic people did with other non-autistic people. However, in the mixed groups of autistic and non-autistic people, much less information was shared. These results are the first empirical evidence that suggests that difficulties in autistic communication are apparent only when interacting with non-autistic people. So um, the study just showed that there is a loss of information um, when you don't have somebody who is neurodivergent on your museum staff. Um, so to me, this just shows that having autistic people working at your museum or in your organization and being part of these programs will increase the amount of meaning that participants can make in these interactions. Um, finally, um, institutions have the ability to apply um, virtual programs as third spaces for social communication. For many people with developmental disabilities, there's a significant drop off in resources after leaving school. Especially for autistic people, approximately one in four are socially isolated, meaning that they rarely see or talk to friends and are not invited to social activities. Um, but museums are social institutions. I love um, the work of Lois Silverman in her book, The, work of, the Social Work of Museums. Um, she talks about how museums have the opportunity to do that social service. Um, and I do think that if museums truly want to develop a relationship with autistic people and be truly inclusive, they'll promote um, mutually beneficial opportunities for learning and development. That includes hiring autistic people to work at your museum, making your hiring practices equitable, making your workplace accessible so that we can increase those opportunities and then get back into that meaning making with autistic audiences. Um, as we say in the community, nothing about us without us. So um, that's my sort of plug for making sure you hire autistic people in your museum. Thank you so much, Sam. Really appreciate you sharing your, your personal and professional experiences. Um, at this time, I'm going to exit and invite all four panelists to join us on screen while I open it up to uh, more questions uh, from the audience. The panelists remain only visible when speaking. Claire's visual has become a black screen with her name written in the middle. So we're going to walk through just a couple questions. Um, the first of which I'm going to open it up to, to anyone that would like to share something that they found surprising when they think back over the last, you know, several months and kind of this time of, of change and interesting, you know, innovation in terms of how we connect with others, specifically virtual approaches. Anything that has surprised any of you in terms of virtual approaches that either worked really well or maybe didn't work so well? Sam. Um, I just wanted to describe an experience that I had earlier in the summer. I joined a few of the webinars um, put on by the 
I don't know if it was the Netflix people or um, the folks involved with the Crip Camp documentary on Netflix, which if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It goes through the history of the, dis the disability rights movement and all these awesome advocates are featured in it, it's super awesome. Um, so they had these this webinar series about um, training disabled people to advocate for disability issues in their communities and in general. And the first few webinars that I joined, there were thousands of people um, watching these webinars. And just like this panel today, there were sign interpreters and live captioning. And something that stood out to me was that anytime somebody couldn't see the interpreter or couldn't access the captions and they wrote that in the chat, the organizers stopped the entire whatever was happening. They paused, they asked a panelist to wait, and they solved the access issue before moving on. So they didn't go through anything unless everybody could understand what was happening. Um, and that just stood out as incredible to me, especially when I compared it to experiences that I was seeing people talk about online um, with professional organizations in our field being less responsive to access needs, especially during live webinars and programs. And it, it really, it bothered me that I couldn't imagine one of those professional organizations pausing a webinar for just a minute to get the sign interpreter back on the screen. And I know as we talked before we started this panel that CCAC um, was planning to take the same approach with this meeting today. Um, and that is just a true sign of values. And we can tell when your organization has access as a value built into it because it comes out in every step of every operation and every program that they do. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate you sharing that example. Any other surprises from your experiences? Charlotte. Thank you, Claire. Um, and I, I want to second uh, Sam's comment. I think everything that she just said is, is super important um, and really valuable. Um, and I was just going to say in answer to the question about what surprised us, I think, you know, I've been surprised um, at how much we've just been able to to do and how much we've been able to open up um, spaces and experiences that we haven't been able to before. Um, and knowing that, you know, once we are able to have groups in the museum and do programs in the museum, we definitely will. And I'm really excited to be able to do that at some point. But we also know that we will be continuing, you know, some um, offering virtual programs as well just because we know that it has been a benefit to some people who maybe aren't able to come to the museum for geographic reasons or other health concerns that are just not able to get to the museum. Um, and so we're really happy um, that we can continue to offer both of those. I think some of the biggest surprises um, were around the way that we have been able to maintain a social atmosphere um, in our programs, particularly those with adult groups um, and in our sensory friendly evenings, which are specifically for adults. Um, and that that's been really wonderful that we've been able to maintain that by encouraging those different types of communication um, by reinforcing those norms early on and setting the expectations around muting and taking turns. So it's actually um, created some nice opportunities. And we noticed that a lot during our all access maker camp um, where, you know, when they're all together in a space and we can't wait to be able to do the camp again at some point in person. But it was great that I, some campers who might have been less comfortable with jumping into a conversation or with sharing something um, about themselves or sharing a project that they did because we had different options for how they could share and how they could communicate. And because we were setting expectations around taking turns that made a huge difference. And it's something that is harder to control in an in-person environment because for projects that they were doing, we'd have two hours in the morning where we're doing the virtual tour and setting expectations and setting up the project. And then there were two hours where they could go off on their own to do their work or they could stay on for office hours if they wanted or just hang out. Um, and then we'd come back at the end of that for another hour to share out projects and prepare for the next day. And because um, campers could record, take a video of their project, take photos of it and send it to us or share it live, we found that kids were actually sharing a lot more than usual. Um, and we're actually getting a lot more feedback than usual because we were able to kind of take our time in a different way 
Um, and there's also less issue around people getting in each other's physical spaces, um, which which was um, which was just a different thing. So it's one of those things I can't wait to be able to do the camp in person and you know handle riveting guns and um, put together airplane parts and, and really get in there. But it is great that we've been able to still continue some of those goals through the virtual environment. Um, and I will just say one challenge has been that for our family programs, because they're public, the ones that we do that are for children, we do keep the cameras off for security reasons because we don't really know who's coming, even though we have registration. Um, so we've had to think about other ways of um, encouraging them to communicate with us and for us to gauge their um, responsiveness through the program. So it's just something that to keep in mind, something to think about. So thank you. Thanks, Charlotte. Moving on to the next question, which is, um, what are some of the top considerations for someone facilitating a virtual program to keep in mind? Jordan. Jordan's video is briefly replaced by an ASL interpreter signing before returning to Jordan in her living space. So I would say the top things to consider and keep in mind I could probably sum it up with six, th six things to keep in mind. And I think it goes back to what all of the panelists have said, including myself today. Uh, number one being communication. And you, we've covered that. And so you kind of know what that looks like, but just keep that in mind. Communication is huge. Um, the second one I would say would be context, um, providing context. Um, giving background information, meanings, things like that help to provide context and allow you to be more engaged um, when you're doing online programming. The third one I would say would be connection. So how is your audience connecting with the information that you're providing? Um, how are you helping them to be able to make um, more connections? and to get excited about, um, I know we're in different times with things being virtually, but these are the connections that they're creating not only virtually will help when things do open back up for in-person. Um, the next one I would say would be consistency, just being consistent. It helps a lot with, there's a lot of things that are changing and every day. So if we can be as consistent as possible, and like I stated before, like the language that we're using and also how we're doing online programming, it helps ease some of the anxiety maybe around um, virtual online programming. The next one I would say would be maybe carryover. So how can your audience carry over the things that you're going through to other settings and also carry over in term, terms of when we open back up how can you carry over these things into in-person? And last one I would say would be create. So creating I think is really important just because like it, someone stated earlier, I think it was um, Ross, it's hard being on virtually just Zooms all day or programming, education, meetings, how whatever you're using Zoom or video chat. So create something, you know, and engage your audience or if they have ideas, maybe you can get feedback from them on different things that they would like to create in a future online program. And that kind of allows them to be just as engaged um, when you are doing online virtual programming. Thank you, Jordan. You're any welcome. other any other thoughts on considerations for facilitators? Ross, thanks. Yes. One thing I would say, again, um, sort of going off what Jordan just said is not just, and what I said earlier, not just listening to needs, but listening to the people talk about themselves. Um, and this goes with everyone. I think most people do enjoy talking about themselves. Um, most people like being able to share things that are important to them. They like being able to get the information that is important to them as a person out. Um, that's a important part of socialization. I was lucky enough to be diagnosed in elementary school and that meant I got social skills classes for all of high school, up through high school. Um, and that was the repeated thing is let other people talk about themselves. And that's really important in the museum field as well because 
if I'm, for example, one of the first tours I gave was at an exhibit about modern art on an artist named Feller Athans, who was the first um, black conservator at the Smithsonian, as well as a successful um, abstract impressionist. A lot of people, if they had just walked in and gone through it, wouldn't have gotten much out of it because it's abstract art and there is a huge contingent of people, including me before I was at this exhibit, I will sadly admit, who do not necessarily like that sort of art. But once I started to give tours that suggested, what are things that you see yourself in? What about this do you like? That really helped. And that I think is important for virtual programming as well. When you can go to someone and say, okay, so what do you like about this within the confines of the program? Incorporating that into programming is huge. Thank you, Ross. We have to let everyone know we have so many wonderful questions in the Q&A and we're not gonna be able to get to them all. So as I mentioned before, we will be compiling all of these with answers for you um, from us or from the panelists here today. We'll provide that in the archive section. I have one last quick question I'm gonna put out um, and from, a pan from um, I'm sorry, a participant, which is in an interactive program for roughly 45 minutes, have you found that there's an ideal number of participants? Anybody have any thoughts on a group size that um, would be helpful? Uh, yeah, Ross, go ahead. Well, the answer is it depends. How comfortable are you with breakout rooms? How comfortable are you with using multiple features of Zoom? If you're not able to use breakout rooms, what I've seen um, doing with public programs at the Idle Jorg is that about 20 ish works really well. Essentially, is it enough that you're going to be able to give participants ample time to speak and participate? Now, in terms of particularly with audiences with intellectual and developmental disabilities, I would cut it down from there even because it can take longer for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to find the word. I have this at times, not everyone does. Again, uh, as Sam so aptly put, I only get to see one case of autism in myself or one experience of autism in myself. I don't get to see everyone else's. I don't get to see, I can only see what I can see. And to, but, if you can keep it into a way where you can either break up the group into discussions or break up the group into sections when you're doing activities so that it's not several hundred people participating all at once, everyone trying to talk over each other, that is an incredibly easy way to do it that I've noticed. But I would love to hear what everyone else has. Thank you, Ross. Yeah, Charlotte, one quick comment before we close. Great. So um, like Ross, I'll say it depends. Um, one thing that I do recommend is for if you're doing a, a program for a school group, a self-contained class, or for a day habilitation group or a recreational group, um, is that as we do for our in-person programs, we really recommend maintaining the typical structure of the group. So if there's normally 12 people in the group and a few um, staff people, then we'll say, let's do that. Let's not combine groups. Um, it's what they're used to. So we wanna maintain what that, it's removing an extra thing that they have to adjust to and prepare for. Um, and we do have two educators um, on each program. There's usually a lead educator and someone who's monitoring the chat and addressing things, which makes a big difference. For the family programs, those are bigger. Um, and we let those be bigger um, because you know, we have the person in the chat there. We're not um, unmuting usually for most of it until the very end. So we're able to kind of keep going through that. Um, so those are a little bit larger for our camp group. We, we maintained a similar group size. So we split the groups, um, split each session into age groups um, of no more than seven or eight in a group with at least two educators on there at a time. Um, so they could have that extra support and we could go into breakout rooms because I was floating around between the groups and able to jump in if we needed another person so we could give extra support. Um, so I think it's being flexible 
and um, really, you know, trying to find out from the teacher or the group leader ahead of time what that usual structure is, what the routines are, and try to, to work those in. And that can be over email or on the phone, really um, whatever is best for them. Thank you, Charlotte. And I'm sorry that we're running out of time. There's there's so many great things to cover. Claire's video resumes. At this time, we're going to bring the session to a close. I want to sincerely thank, again, our four wonderful panelists, Charlotte, Jordan, Ross, and Sam, um, for sharing their experiences. We really appreciate your time and commitment to this event. Um, in addition, special thanks to my committee co-planner, Emma McLean, who is managing the back end as along with some other steering committee volunteers, Hillary, Karen, Risa, thank you all so much for your support and helping today's event run smoothly and making sure that everybody had access at all times that we were addressing things as best as we could. So thank you all for speaking up when there were issues as well. Um, so that concludes our program. We really appreciate you all joining us. Uh, we hope you'll stay connected with CCAC via social media staying tuned in with our website for future programs. And until then, we hope you have a wonderful day and stay safe. Thank you. Fade to Black, white text on black background, engaging individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities in virtual programs. Presented by Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. For workshop resources and more information, visit chicagoculturalaccess.org. Presenting speakers, Claire Kelly, moderator, Charlotte Martin, Senior Manager of Access Initiatives at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. Based in New York, Jordan Saunders, Speech-Language Pathologist and Disability Inclusion Consultant at The Resource Key, based in Virginia. Ross Edelstein, Accessibility Consultant and Public Programs Intern at the Idle Jorg Museum, based in Indiana. Sam Theralt, Independent Museum Professional and Membership and Marketing Manager at Museum Education Roundtable, based in New Hampshire. Workshop Planning and Accessibility, Emma McLean and Claire Kelly, CCAC Workshop Planners, Hillary Pearson, Rissa Rifkin, and Karen Techfer, CCAC Workshop Volunteers, Kathy Raycan, Real-Time Captioning, Video Editing, Captioning, and Audio Description by BridgetMelton.com, Video Fades to Black.